Hello people of the earth and welcome to QuickSafe TV. My name is Mike and today I'm going to present to you the StarCraft 2 Heart of the Swarm expansion pack. Specifically I'm going to talk about new units which were presented three days ago in these two awesome videos. One of them was the presentation of units. It's nine units in total for Protoss, Terran and the Zerg. And the other one was, let me adjust the microphone just slightly, another one was the battle lock in which we've seen Protoss and Zerg actually combat each other. Not the best possible players but I'm not the the best player myself, but still it was enough to actually see and theorize for how these units can be actually used, what difference can they bring on the battlefield, and you know, what's the big fuss about, who gives a damn, right? I do give a damn, and I'm sure you do as well. Uh, it seems that the StarCraft 2 community is very interested in this upcoming expansion. I'm also myself, it seems extremely diverse, the new units that added, they really add to the game. Uh, allow you to use different strategies like in case of Protoss you get very powerful very very powerful air solutions in case of Terran you get even more max solutions and in case of the Zerg it gives you the breaking solutions which is awesome even more even better even cooler now we're gonna start with the Protoss just as the video suggested to us and I'm gonna talk a little bit in more detail than an actual video I will provide the link in the uh, description go ahead and check it out if you didn't already and since it's very short there, I'm going to go in a little bit more detail here. So, we have the Mothership Core, which is kind of a replacement of the Mothership building process. Now, before in StarCraft II Wings of Liberty, when you would like to build a Mothership, what would you do? You're like, oh, herp de derp de derp build the Mothership. Here you go, right? Not how it works anymore. In order to build one, you will have to first build Mothership Core, which is in essence an add-on to your Nexus. Now, unlike um, Planetary Fortress or Orbital Command for Terran, this upgrade, Mothership Core, can only be built once. I mean, it can only, you can only simultaneously have one of them, okay? If it gets destroyed, you will probably be able to rebuild it, but you can only have one at the same time. The problem with this building is that it's fragile as hell, okay? It has 350 on 350, which in essence means 700 hit points, which is not a lot, especially if there's some mariners or, uh, you know, anything, pretty much anything that can shoot, shoot at buildings, and a lot of things can, trust me. And you have to be really careful with that, in all honesty. I can see it being a very difficult, a tricky building to defend, unlike Planetary Fortress or even Orbital Command for Terran. So it's, it's not so easy to destroy these things. They're pretty sturdy and they can be repaired. But in case of Protoss, it's twice less sturdy. It cannot be repaired. Be careful, okay? Next. So what it is, in essence? It is a tactical and defensive structure. First interesting ability it has, but far not most useful in my opinion, is Purify. Purify is the transformation for s some time of the Mothership Core in order to be a very strong cannon. Now the damage range would be about 50-ish? 40 something to 50 because it kills Hydra Discs in two shots. So I assume it's about 40, 50, much like Planetary Fortress. Now, the problem with it, the same thing I said, it's not that sturdy, so you have to be really careful. And I can see in multiplayer battles, because it consumes energy, you might want to provoke your enemy to actually use it up without attacking him. You don't want to stay under fire there while he uses it, but this wasted energy will work against him and work in your favor. So you have to be careful, try to provoke the enemy, maybe with Zerglings, maybe with some Marines, you know, Marauders, whatever you do, you have to be very careful. And as the owner of this building, you have to be goddamn sure when you use it, you know, and how you actually use it so you can survive. Next, must we call a lot like Mothership's ability, nothing new here. Must Recall is very expensive, 150 energy, excuse me, out of 200, and you really have to think when you use it, because when you use it, you waste 75% of your max pool energy, even if you were at max energy, which means next time you will be able to use something cool, will not be really soon. You have to be extremely careful, but how it can be used? You could do a raid against the enemy without, you know, having any plan to get back from there. You go there, destroy the hatchery and you teleport back really quickly, saving most of your units. Good idea, isn't it? Allows you, the Protoss, to be more aggressive, but again, it's just one per a certain amount of time, so you have to be careful. It's not like you can, you know, you build a bunch of Nexuses, you build a bunch of Mothership Cores, and you, you know, recall back your ass out. No, because it's just one building, consumes a lot of energy, you have to be careful. 
and they store energy ability, which seems to be working on units. Not sure about the buildings because I think if it will work on buildings, we will have a situation when we will have a spam of chronoboosts, which won't be good for balance. So I'm not sure how it's going to work. But a store energy as such can allow you to restore the energy on a critical unit on the battlefield. It might be sent to you. It might be a new added oracle. It might be anything you want. It might be whatever you want. Whatever you think is critical on the battlefield. You need additional force field to survive? Sentry. You need to harass your enemy more and you want to yield more, you know, out of damage in his economy? Oracle, okay? It depends on the situation. Very, very great building. I love it a lot. Finally, Protoss will have something like, something like an add-on on Nexus. It's very cool. Something new, you know, it looks amazing, okay? On top of that, it looks amazing. It looks really cool. Looks natural on the Nexus. Next unit is the Oracle. Oracle is this annoying bastard, <coughs> which they state as a harassment specialist. I call him annoying asshole. This annoying asshole has two key abilities. It is Entomb and Cloakfield. Now, Entomb as such allows you to entomb the minerals on the... The minerals... It allows you to entomb the minerals on the enemy base preventing him to effectively mine out of his economy. Doing that frequently to the enemy will hurt his economy in the long run tremendously. And if you do that, especially against the Zerg, oh my goodness, you can, it can yield a lot of effectiveness. When you're playing on less bases than the Zerg, which is obvious, okay, you can hurt the Zerg easily by doing that. Of course, Oracle is not cheap, but this ability, you know, is very powerful. It seems to be lasting for about 15 seconds, 10 to 15 seconds, and the strength of Entomb, it's a cocoon, which has 75 hit points. Of course, it can be destroyed, but, you know, you don't have your army at your mineral line always, do you? Do you? You're immune to this. <laughs> Next thing, uh, Clock Field. Clock Field allows you, in essence, to... You know, utilize cloak field, much like the Arbiter from StarCraft 1. Now, the problem with the cloak field is that Oracle remains vulnerable while it is not active, much like the Mothership. You have to be careful. So, when you are in a situation when you think that your Oracle is far behind enough in order to survive, or the enemy will not be able to pick him up, uh, pick him off, excuse me, you can use the cloaking field in order to yield additional combat effectiveness. Very, very cool abilities. You see, it adds to the diversity in the game. It sounds really cool. And on top of that, Oracle seems to be a cute Protoss girl in the ship, which I could not not notice, and it's it's amazing. Okay, a unit design is great. I liked it a lot. It seems like this this kind of thingy, which like flies around, pew, Pew, pew. I'm an annoying harass unit. Pew, I entomb your minerals. Pew, I hurt your money. I waste your money. Protoss style. Next, Tempest. It's an extremely long range unit. Like, it says long range. It's not long range. It's like a sniper rifle, extremely long, freaking far away range. It seems to be about 20, <clears throat> at least from what Day9 says. He said 22. I'm not sure if it's credible, if they're going to change it or whatever. But it seems to be like a flying, super heavy, super slow artillery unit. Okay? It doesn't deal tremendous, gigantic damage at range. But the thing is, it doesn't have to deploy. It doesn't have to deploy. It stays mobile. It's healthy enough. And it shoots from a far away distance. Extremely powerful, okay? And in the, with the combination with Oracle's additional ability, which I didn't mention, excuse me, because I've seen it in a battle report and I completely forgot about it, he, Oracle can put, um, um, how do you call it, an observer, a scout, into the enemy building, much like the Queen could throw a parasite in StarCraft 1, and allows you to see from the perspective of this building, allowing your Tempest to shoot from really, really far away and bombard enemy structures from really far distance. Now, Tempest is extremely effective against units that cannot be engaged in direct combat or should be picked off from afar. We're talking about, I apologize, the Zerg units. We're talking about Viper, Swarm Host, two other units. And we're talking, when we talk about Terran, we're talking about Annoying Vikings, which cannot reach it, obviously, now, and um, uh, Siege Tanks, the most important Siege Tanks, okay? Because Siege Tanks are at, at the real disadvantage against these units. It seems that the Terran will have to use some uh, air forces in order to actually stand a chance against such a behemoth in the air. 
The downsides of Tempest is of course it's extremely clumsy and because the distance of its firing is so far an average player might easily leave the Tempest far behind his actual forces and will leave no cover for him. Which means that Tempest can be easily, easily picked off by a skilled player and you really, really have to be careful of them. I expect it to be a really expensive unit. You won't be able to build a lot of them and if you do, they're really expensive. You have to be really careful. They will work best with slight or, you know, moderate support of other flying units. Very cool. This was Protoss. Seems cool, eh? Next, Terran. We have the addition of Battle Helion, which is a transformation of a normal Helion and will allow the uh, uh, Helion to become an essence of fire bat from StarCraft 1. Much sturdier, of course, as a fire bat, but um, the point of this transformation is to have this additional armor and hit points to transform into a hard and a heavy target, which will be able to hold against light units in close quarters. We talk about zerglings, zealots, whatever it is, okay, even marines to a certain degree. It will still have this stupid splash of it and will effectively hold the line. Um, of course, it has to be transformed into a, you know, into a battle helion from a normal helion, but it's not a big deal. And it seems to be sturdy enough to stand a lot of punishment. But I'm not sure what's the price going to be, what's the cost going to be. I probably can transform back, which is really annoying. Again, you could easily roll inside the enemy base, transform into battle helions and attack. You know, it opens up a lot of new strategies and allows Terran to play even more effective mech with these strong units. It's like a mix of a fire bat and marauder. Okay, with the addition of the same old Helion, because you can still use it. Cool. Next unit for Terran is the Warhound. Warhound is a lot like Goliath, but with a simple, very interesting twists. Uh, Warhound is the anti-mechanical unit, as it states, is, or you could say anti, anti-mechanical, anti anti-vehicle, because, you know, Zerg also have vehicles, and I'm sure the uh, Warhound will effectively attack them as well, but the Zerg vehicles are organic, you know, you don't really call them vehicles, they're still living creatures, just very tough, very strong, etc., etc. Now, in essence, Warhound is this walking, quick enough, average, average walking speed, faster than the siege tanks, it seems, um, uh, unit that can attack with its main cannon, right? It attacks simple targets with its main cannon. Bah, 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 bah. And it uses this auto-firing missile against mechanical units, which is, in essence, it seems to be that this Goliath, this Warhound, can easily attack units at closer range while keep bombarding the faraway enemy targets, such as, for example, it can attack Zealots while at the same time attacking Colossi which is very important, because you keep dealing damage to the critical targets while still being able to deal this additional damage to the targets in front of you. All these damages are not known yet, but it's a very cool, interesting designed unit. It looks like a mech with the shield. It looks very cool. I, you know, I really recommend you to check it out. Next one is the Widow Mine, an annoying mine that works in this, the, the um, oh my goodness, I don't even know how to say it. It's very different. From it looks, it works like a sticky grenade from Call of Duty, Semtex grenade. Imagine a Semtex grenade that you throw on the ground, and it becomes a mine. Okay, and if the enemy steps on it, it's gonna stick to him. It obviously is invisible. When he steps on it, it becomes stuck to him, right? And will detonate in about eight seconds. One could say, "Oh, eight seconds! <laughs> it's a lot of time. I have a lot of time to actually, you know." take it off, this unit's off of the battlefield and, you know, save my other units. Yeah, you're technically are correct, but it might get difficult in a very hard battle. So, for example, if there, even if there's like four of these mines, you have to quickly pick these units, get them out of the battlefield, so that the majority of the army doesn't die. It's, it's not so much a killer, but it's a, you know, a tactical breaker. You know, it allows you to force your enemy to micro much harder than he actually has to, making your, the encounters for you are much easier because he has to, you know, do something about it if he doesn't want to lose all of his army. So, it's not as strong as the, um, the, uh, hunter sickle missile, but it seems to be a very, very powerful solution when you have to have this additional room to breathe. Kulzors, the Zerg, my favorite race, I'm not gonna lie. I like the units. Um, I was skeptical at first, but now I, I seem to like them. I, I didn't like Swarm Host at first, but it seems to be working fine. We'll have to see, of course, but yeah. We have the Swarm Host, which is a kind of a mushroom that goes around burrows into the ground. Looks a lot like Lurker, I mean, in the, in the, the way it operates, with a little twist. 
Now, unlike Lurker, Swarm Host, while burrowed, does not attack directly. Swarm Host, every 25 seconds, it spawns Locust, uh, Locust, what do you call it? Yeah, spawns Locust, which is a unit that can attack both ground and air at a very short distance. It's small as a Zergling, maybe even a little bit smaller, which can attack both air and ground. It's relatively fast, not extremely fast, but it's free. And when you have the swarm host de deposited into the ground, it will continue to spawn them continuously for a lot of time for free. So it doesn't cost you anything. Every 25 seconds, you have to spawn, you know, which is extremely annoying. And, you know, it can be an it's like a siege engine of the Zerg now. It allows you to use any kind of ranged units in behind, such as Hydra Discs now, which was extremely well demonstrated in the battle report, because now, since you have this free meat shield, you can easily use the more fragile units in behind, no problem. Cool. Next one is the Viper. Viper is the, it's called, Battleground Manipulation Unit. You, call, you know, like, very cool way to call it. In essence, it's a tactical unit, which reminds you kind of an Overseer. I think the Overseer got removed, I'm not sure, I don't really remember anymore. But the thing is, Viper is a very powerful addition to the Zerg army. It allows you to break enemy lines, to do, it has these abilities, it has the Ancient Sphere of Barbarian, from Diablo 3 and Diablo 2. I think it has uh, it, <laughs> it has blinding cloud from the defiler the defiler from Starcraft 1 and it's overall a very annoying unit now abduct what does it do it throws this tongue of itself and pulls back the enemy unit be that a flying unit be that a siege tank whatever it is it pulls it back amidst in the, the middle, in the middle of your army, okay? So, for example, you have the enemy like, Herp, derp, I'm on the high ground, you can go screw yourself. You're like, really? You know? <laughs> pull the enemy inside your forces and just deal with them really quickly. You can pull siege tanks, tempests, maybe even motherships. I'm not sure about it, but I'm not, I don't think they will allow you to... They probably will, since you can pull, pull gigantic tempests. Maybe you can pull the mothership as well. But the thing is, it's insane, okay? It's just really, really crazy. And uh, because of that, you, Zerg now gets this opportunity to break enemy lines without dancing around like Hydra does, like Hydra Hydra does in his videos, in his in his matches. You know, Hydra is this very good player for the Zerg, uh, controversial one, very aggressive, generally very very you know poisonous. I like him a lot. Very interesting person. And the thing is, the thing is, when he plays, and if you notice the way he plays, he's actually dancing around Terran. You know and waits for the Terran to make a mistake. And when the Terran makes the mistake, he attacks him, he leaps on him, okay? He waits for this opportunity. Now, with the Viper, theoretically, you could technically break the lines of the enemy, pull the siege banks to you and deal with them, which is really important, okay? Because before that, you would have to kind of, you know, dance around. Now you can brutally pull them back to you and just break their lines of defense, which is brutal, okay? Absolutely amazing unit, I love it. And the Blinding Cloud, of course, drops the Blinding, the, the, this cloud, which reduces the range of all the units inside it to one, making them absolutely useless against your moving the tide of your forces. It can be Zerglings, Banelings, Ultralisks, whatever it is, very, very powerful ability. And the Ultralisk, which has evolved once again, Ultralisk will never die out, you know, because it's annoying. Uh, unlike the dinosaurs, which were also probably very annoying. But I don't want to be racist to dinosaurs. Maybe one of them lives and he's like, Mike, you're dead. And I'm like, okay, I will never say anything bad about you once again. Just let me live. Now, Ultralisk now has the Burrow Charged, Burrow Charged which allows him to actually burrow and charge. Big fucking wonder, right? Burrow and charge at the enemy. How is this important? Before that, technically, the Ultralisk would be in a very, very bad position to attack the enemy. In many circumstances, Ultralisk would die like a fly. Just because, just because it would, okay? In the circumstances on the battlefield. Now, because it can burrow and charge at the enemy, unless, I expect, unless there is a solid wall-off of buildings, it will be able to close this gigantic gap to anything and just tear the enemy to pieces. 
Because of that, Ultraris gains a tremendous amount of uh, DPS boost and will actually not die before killing someone. I should adjust the camera. It will actually not die before killing someone. And this adds all together, this, if you look at these changes all together, we have the addition of Mothership Core, Oracle and Tempest for Protoss, which generally increase the Protoss capabilities to harass, to assault with great distance, with great efficiency, okay, and makes Protoss more, more uh, tactical, even more tactical race, which is really important. For Terran, we have Battle Helion, Warhound, and Widow Mine, which allows Terran to play even more mech heavy, even more uh, effective mech plays. I expect to see a lot of more powerful mech plays for for Terran, just because it seems that like the more ra most rational solution. And for the Zerg, it allows Zerg to play, break the lines of defense of Terran specifically and Protoss, distort the lines distort this organized fashion in which they want to fight to make it in your favor, to pull them, to kill them, to destroy their lines, to reduce their range, you know, to do anything, to charge at them, to, you know, what the Zerg does the best, and to dominate the battlefield with the chip, free actually, low cost, from the swarm host. And that's about it for the units. That's a very, very intensive video. I'm really sorry. It got really big. Um, I hope you enjoyed it, nevertheless. It was really interesting to talk to you about it. If you enjoyed the video, please go ahead and subscribe to my channel. I would greatly appreciate your help with that because it's just... I want to grow, you know? It makes me really happy, man, to see my channel grow. Have a great day and bye-bye. Yeah, remember, always choose Russian wasps. Brutal Spetsnaz what? <laughs> Priority for armor, not so much for damage. Preference for shield. On top of that, we have very high resistances on, across the board.